To get an idea of the conformation of a district and the flow of the rivers, it is expedient to ascend elevated points once a panorama of the land may be obtained. It is impossible in the brief space of a chapter to give more than a general conception of the history of the duchy or kingdom of Brittany. Without a comprehensive survey, the visitor cannot properly appreciate what he sees. Nor will the reader of this book know where to place the several historic episodes that occur in the description of several localities. One looks on a face, and that face at once acquires an interest in our eyes if it bears the traces of some great sorrow that has swept over the past life, giving to it sweetness and strength. And so is it with towns. They acquire at once an attraction when we can discern in them the traces of history, the impress of sore distresses, perhaps of glorious achievements. I will take a few salient features of Breton history and indicate the lines of connection so as to enable the reader to obtain something of historic perspective. As has been already said, Armorica was occupied during the 5th and 6th centuries by successive swarms of immigrants from Britain, who brought over with them their own language institutions and ecclesiastical as well as secular organizations. These colonists succeeded in changing the appellation of the peninsula from Armorica to Lesser Britain, and in totally changing the language spoken therein, and impressing upon the natives their own tongue, which was identical with that spoken in Wales and Cornwall. At first, the new settlers recognized their dependence on the princes of the mother country, but this attachment relaxed, and very speedily, two Breton kingdoms were constituted, that of Domnonia and that of Cornubia, or Cornoie. The former comprised the whole of the north coast from the Quesnon to the Western Sea, and was bounded on the south by that chain of mountains that runs from the Mont to Pobriac, and thence continues as the Mons d'Arre to the sea above Brest. The southwestern coastland constituted the kingdom of Cornoille to the river Elle. The interior of the peninsula was occupied by the vast forest of Brésilien. The early history is so perplexed that I shall not trouble the reader with it till we arrive at the time of Jonas, king of Domnonia, who died in 540. He left an only son, a boy, Judual, and Conmor, count of Poe, who married the widow of Jonas, undertook the charge of the young prince, and the regency during his minority. He was an ambitious man, and his wife suspected that he had designs on the life of her son. She accordingly sent him to the court of Childebert at Paris, where he was retained in surveillance. About the year 550, S. Samson appeared at Dole, ostensibly to found a monastery there, but actually to organize an insurrection against Conmore. He went ever and anon to Jersey, where he drilled soldiers, and he sent his monks about Domnonia to incite to rebellion. Then he visited Paris, and with difficulty induced Childebert to release Judual. When all was ripe, the Bretons rose against the usurper, who was defeated in three battles and was killed in 555. The history of Brittany continued to be one of fratricidal conflict and slaughter, from generation to generation. According to Celtic custom, every principality was broken up into separate portions for every son of a king on that king's death, and then the most masterful of the heirs cut the throats of his brethren unless they succeeded in putting the sea between themselves and him. Usually, they took refuge in Wales or Cornwall. At last, Namino, a very remarkable man who had been invested with the lieutenancy of Brittany by Louis the Pious in 826, resolved on shaking off the Frank yoke and establishing the independence of his country. He remained faithful to the Frank Emperor so long as Louis lived, but on his death, seeing that the empire was crumbling to pieces and that the desired opportunity had come, he raised the standard of revolt. He was warmly seconded by S. Convoyant, abbot of Redon. Louis had been succeeded by Charles the Bald in 840, who had inherited the crown of Charlemagne, but none of his abilities. In 845, the preparations of Namino were complete, and in a series of battles in which he was uniformly successful, he achieved his purpose. He further drove the Franks out of Nantes and René, and definitely united these counties to Brittany. He did more. He repelled the Northmen who had descended on and were ravaging the country. Having established himself supreme, he reorganized Brittany ecclesiastically into seven dioceses, whereof Dole was one, which he erected into an archbishopric with jurisdiction over the six suffragan sees, and then was crowned king. Namino died in 851. His eldest son was Erispo, who inherited the crown and continued the work of his father, repelled Charles the Bald, who made a new attempt to recover Brittany and was likewise successful against the Northmen. Namino had left two other sons, Gerwan and Pasquitian, and a nephew, Solomon. This latter assassinated his cousin Erispo before the altar of the Church of Pempon and assumed the crown. 
he proceeded to buy off the Northmen and promise a tribute to Charles the Bald. But although Solomon had gained the object of his ambition, his conscience troubled him on account of his sacrilege and murder, and he sent a deputation to Rome to buy his absolution. Now the Archbishop of Tours had claimed jurisdiction over Brittany, a jurisdiction that had only been acknowledged by Nantes, René, and Vin, and the Pope viewed with a jealous eye the attempt of Naminot to establish a Breton church on independent lines. He accordingly agreed to absolve Solomon at the price of undoing the ecclesiastical organization of his uncle, Naminot. To this, Solomon, caring only for his own soul, readily consented. But the Bretons were by no means disposed to have Naminot's work destroyed, and they rose in revolt under Pasquitian, the son of the late king, and Solomon, finding himself deserted on all hands, fled with his son for refuge to a church, out of which he and the boy were dragged and both killed, 874. For some unaccountable reason, the Bretons have regarded this despicable assassin as a saint. His violent death has been taken to have expiated his crime and his betrayal of the national liberties. The death of Solomon was the signal for the division of Brittany and for the internecine strife, in the midst of which the northern rovers recommenced their ravages, which they carried on unmolested, as there was no central authority to oppose them. The desolation became so general, and the misery and insecurity so great, that many Bretons, together with Mathieu Dois, Count of Boe, escaped to England and threw themselves on the protection of Athelstan. But in 937, Alain Babetot, son of Mathieu Dois, returned and carried on a successful campaign against the Northmen, whom he defeated and put to the sword. The history of Brittany continued to be one of sanguinary internal strife, alternating with fights against the Normans until the reign of Conan III. Conan had married Matilda, daughter of Henry I of England, and had by her two children, Oel and Bertha. Suspecting his wife of infidelity on his deathbed, he protested that Hoel was no son of his. Bertha, by her first husband, had a son, Conan, who rose in revolt against his stepfather. One part of Brittany acknowledged Conan, another recognized Eudo de Bonneau, the husband of Bertha. Conan summoned Henry II of England to his aid, and to secure his assistance gave his infant daughter, Constance, to Geoffrey Plantagenet the son of the English king. This was the beginning of that continuous series of civil wars in which the English took part, and which lasted from the close of the 12th century to that of the 15th, 300 years during which the English burnt and ravaged Brittany on one pretext after another. 